Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm glad that you've been able to join us today for this uh, this week's, this month's Geotox Express webinar. Um, I'm Mackenzie Mills, an Associate Product Manager here at Blue Marble Geographics, and I'm joined today by Jeff Hatzel, and we are going to talk about our top 10 tips and tricks in Global Mapper Pro. So these are all going to be related to Global Mapper Pro, and maybe some features or, or uses of tools that you hadn't thought about before. Um, so how are you doing today, Jeff? I'm doing good, thanks. It's uh, nice to be back with you here. Hopefully, um, everybody's not getting tired of hearing you and me at Geotox um, since we've done the last few. We'll have to keep everybody entertained. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, we will today. <laughs> um, so, just a little bit about the webinar format, the same stuff we always go over for those of you who are not familiar, may have not attended a webinar um, with us ever or not in a while. Um, attendees are in listen only mode. So hopefully that you can hear us, but we unfortunately cannot hear you if you are talking back to us. Um, if you do have questions, comments, anything you'd like to communicate to us, there should be a questions panel that you see in your GoToWebinar interface. Please type questions, comments, um, you know, say hi in that panel, and Jeff and I will be taking a look at that as we go along and trying to get to as many questions as we can. Lastly, this session is being recorded, so if you have to step out or you want to, you know, watch this again later, share with someone else, uh, this will be on YouTube in um, a little bit of time uh, after we're done with the live session today. Um, and as a registered attendee, you should get an email notifying you uh, when that recording is up and available to review. So with that, Jeff, do you wanna talk about some of the upcoming stuff we have coming up here? Yeah, sure. Um, two exciting things that I don't think Mackenzie and I will be involved in in terms of GeoTalk Express. Um, Blue Marble's academic program is usually during the month of April. So the April GeoTalk Express, um, we'll be discussing what we are doing for our academic month. Um, there's usually a mix of you know course-related content, um, I believe we still do uh, the scholarship as well. So that's if you're in academia still, make sure to attend that one. Um, and then we have an exciting announcement coming up in May, uh, a beta version of a new tool called Calculator Online. So if you are someone who uses the Geographic Calculator desktop uh, or has any interest in geodetics, I encourage you to um, tune in for the the introduction of that tool and in, in its beta phase um, our team has been working really hard on that over the, the past little bit here so that's going to be a very exciting uh webinar to attend and, and take a look at and we also are starting um a blue marble podcast called the geotox podcast um <clears throat> our Next upcoming episode, which you can access through uh, the QR code, is actually going to be with one of our former team members. Uh, those of you who have been around a while, I am sure, have come across, across Katrina Schweikert's name uh, on the Blue Marble side of the house. Uh, well, she is now working on her PhD at the University of Maine, and so she's going to be joining us to discuss um, some of her current P, uh, PhD work uh, in relation to geospatial knowledge graphs. So. Uh, go ahead and grab that QR code there, um, take a look on our website, and keep an eye out for uh, this and all of our future podcasts. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. We're really excited about the new podcast if you want to um, hear more about how Global Mapper is being used in some really interesting projects. Um, for our last upcoming slide here, we have some upcoming training. Um, so we periodically do training um, on our programs, uh, a lot on Global Mapper. Um, we have an in-person session coming up at the end of April, and um, that's going to be in Sydney, Australia. So if you're joining us from there, um, you know, maybe, and you want to learn more about how to best use Global Mapper and do some LiDAR processing in Global Mapper Pro, um, check out our website for more information about that training. Uh, we also have some online sessions coming up in May. Uh, we've broken our training down into you know, three courses here. Um, geospatial analysis and global mapper, and more of the basics, working with some vector data, some imagery, um, just you know, getting getting 
used to the program, getting familiar with Global Mapper and doing some of those um, vector data jobs. Next, we have terrain analysis in Global Mapper, and that's all about working with terrain um, in the program. So they are, there are many, many tools in Global Mapper having to do with terrain analysis and all the, the different things you can do for terrain editing, creating derivative products and whatnot. So you'll learn all about that in that second course. And then our third course is LiDAR processing. So all about working with those point clouds, getting information from those and processing through them um, because they, they are valuable data, but they can be a beast to work with sometimes. Um, so if you're interested in any of these training courses, uh, you want more information, you want to sign up, please visit our website. Um, that is on screen there uh, for more information, the agenda, sign up dates and, and pricing and, and some other information. Um, it's also good to note that we do have a training online classroom site, training.bluemarblegeo.com, um, and this has some introductory and new feature training courses. These are self-paced online um, training courses, a mix of some videos, screenshots, written out workflows, data is provided there. Um, so if you are interested in you know, the very basics of Global Mapper and Geographic Calculator, um, Go ahead and check out those courses and recently um, Jeff and I actually wrote some uh, content for that site for some of the new features in Global Mapper 25.1 uh, in Global Mapper Standard and Global Mapper Pro and those courses are now live on that training site so go ahead and check those out if you're looking to get a little more familiar with the new stuff in the new version of Global Mapper. And with that we'll move on to uh, the, the point of this webinar, the goal of it here, which is our agenda and our top 10 tips and tricks. Um, we're going to start with LiDAR draw modes, you know, exploring your LiDAR data um, a little bit more. We'll look at um, a way to get some area specific LiDAR statistics, uh, creating a swath separation grid, a little bit of analysis there. Uh, we'll create and use some keyboard shortcuts for manual classification, so helping to speed up that process a little bit. Um, saving changes to a loaded file, so overwriting a file um, outside of Global Mapper with any changes that have been made inside the program. Uh, we'll do a guided manual feature extraction um, using the segmentation tool. We will grid a point cloud by some different attributes, uh, work on building a Python script through a script builder tool, create a quick ortho image uh, with pixels to points, and then do some terrain and image painting at the end. So a whole variety of tools here um, and some, some interesting workflows that Jeff and I have for you today. So with that, I think uh, you're going to start with our workflows here, Jeff, if I pass you the screen and we can get going with these tips and tricks. Alrighty, that sounds good. You know, I was looking at that list and in my head that, that list felt short, but it's actually quite a few, um, you know, in-depth workflows there that we're going to be working through, I think. Yeah, I think we're, we have some good workflows um, and hopefully some stuff that uh, not everyone has seen before from Global Mapper and everyone attending can, can learn something new, a new tip or trick. Yeah. Um, so to start here, we are looking at uh, a point cloud, and I have used this point cloud before um, simply because of its great quality. Uh, it was shared with us from one of our partners, I believe, Southeastern Surveying and Mapping Company. Um, but it's a, it's a point cloud scan of a bridge. Um, and back when I was um, more frequently teaching training in person and online, um, I always used to harp on all the information that you can get from a point cloud before even starting to analyze it. Uh, you know, we have all these really powerful analytical tools that we talk about, um, but before you even use those, you can learn so much about your point cloud. And so to start there, just thinking about what does visualizing my point cloud tell me? Um, so currently we're looking at this point cloud by RGB. Uh, it happens to be a point cloud that, that has RGB with it. Um, initially, top-down perspective, right? We can see some of our vegetation. This is probably some kind of a road structure. We've got some light posts, things like that. The picture becomes more clear, right? When we start to look at things colored by elevation. I can see whatever these features are. I happen to know they're light posts, right? They're, they're rather tall, considering the, the elevation shading that they're getting. And I can see I have something here that looks lower, right? These blue points are, 
are kind of below the green points here. So probably a bridge, probably rocky structure. Maybe we're going for um, some water here as well. So we're gonna already get a little bit of a, of a look at our, at our data set and at the landscape that it is representing. Um, a really handy visualization option is height above ground. And what this does is it actually it calculates a really general under the hood ground, um, not really classification, um, but then colors our data based on that. So rather than you know your absolute elevation, you're looking at elevation relative to what it thinks is the ground surface. So we can see, right, we definitely have some lower um, elevation points here, um, probably representing uh, a really low surface. Oh, well, look how good that palm tree stands out there. Um, <clears throat> I hadn't noticed that one before. And then very common with point clouds um, and also a common thing used in some more advanced analytical steps is intensity. And intensity is essentially the strength of the return uh, back to the point cloud. And it allows you to really get a feel for what type of object you might be looking at. Um, generally speaking, you know, things like vegetation, trees, uh, and structures of that nature tend to be darker because um, they have usually more water associated with them. Um, Man-made structures can vary a little bit in their intensity ranges um, simply because the, the uh, material that they're made of can impact um, the, that intensity as well. So a whole bunch of information we can kind of gather uh, in that regard. And we'll go look at one other intensity related thing in a second here, um, but worth noting just from a visual perspective, right? we can kind of see these holes in the data or these little circular artifacts always a very good indication that um, this point cloud was probably terrestrial and taken from a tripod, right? The tripod not being able to scan itself there. So that's probably those artifacts we're seeing there. We'll just go back and look at color for a second because it would be silly not to remember that we can take a look at a point cloud in uh, 3D. And one of the things I wanted to point out here very cool and really just noise, but this was on an active highway. So all of the noise from the scanner hitting the cars as the cars drove by, you know, created this kind of artifact above the above the road here. We can see that in 2D as well, those lines. Um, this data I, I classified earlier, so I can go ahead and, you know, filter off my noise and then it looks you know, much cleaner. And we'll take a look at 3D now. It looks looks much more as I would expect a road surface to look there. One last thing I want to point out here in terms of visualizing our LIDAR. Um, let's go ahead and um, go back and take a look at intensity, right? And the intensity here, we are not seeing a ton, um, a ton of range. And that usually makes me wonder, right? This would be grayscale and everything looks pretty much the same shade here, maybe a little darker with the vegetation. Uh, that makes me just wonder what the range of my data looks like. So if I go into my metadata and take a look at my histograms, you can build a histogram of uh, you know distributions based on any number of attributes. So I'm not gonna recalculate these now, it takes a second to calculate. But what this is showing us here is that we do have some very high intensity value outliers. So maybe before I start processing, I want to, delete those, filter those out, clean those up, whatever the case may be. And that might help me get a little bit of a better visual and better representation of my data. Another way that we can think about our point clouds and begin to, to gain some information about them and um, of their associated attributes and statistics is by taking a look at statistics within the polygon. So I'm gonna take a look at a, a separate data set here that we're also gonna use for our, our subsequent workflow. Um, but one, one of the options we have is to effectively get summary statistics within a given area. This happens to be a point cloud of uh, the capital region in Maine, so near our company's headquarters. Uh, it's just a, a pretty point cloud. We've been using it and referencing it for a while. But in this scenario, um, I also have a building footprint, right? The footprint for uh, one of the buildings at the capital complex. 
And what I want to know if, you know, in this case, I'm working on maybe modeling this building, understanding its structure, maybe I, I need to have a certain whatever amount of information associated with it. I can use any area feature, any, any vector area feature, and go ahead and calculate the LIDAR statistics in a given area. So just a, a digitizer based function in our right click menu. And this will do two things. It will give us a quick little update, uh, point count, elevation range, and intensity values, kind of some of the, the more popular, most important things that we look for when you know summarizing a point cloud in an area. But then what it also does is, let me show my building off, adds it, all that information is attributes to all the points in that area. So now I have all of that information associated with that feature, or excuse me, I have clicked the wrong thing here, but <laughs> the idea still stands. I have with that area feature, all of those statistics now associated with it. So if I needed to save that out as a report, or maybe I'm saving my data out as a shape file and I want to retain the, this attribute information, I have all of that handy as a reference to um, you know, features that I'm working with. I know it's very common. We have a few users who test you know, different LiDAR hardware and you know, they might grab these summary statistics for a point cloud for each different scanner in the same area and see what those values look like. So another handy way to kind of begin to learn a little bit more um, about our point clouds. Going a little bit further along those lines before I kick things back to Mackenzie here, uh, a version or two ago, we added a tool um, called the swath separation images. Uh, this is a tool very commonly used um, by the USGS and that, that's where we got the, the idea for, for it from. And it initially was designed to create an image of offset or overlap between two different point clouds. Um, well, inherently when you're, you're working with point cloud data, it's three dimensional. And so what we wanted to add to this was the ability to um, go ahead and create an elevation grid as well. Uh, that allows us to model these things, maybe conduct some volume calculation measurement and things of that nature um, as part of this data set. So in this case, uh, we look at the source ID and the attribute of the point cloud, but of course, uh, if I had multiple overlapping flights in separate files, I could handle it that way as well. Let me just give this a quick little name here. And now I have two new files. I have a grid, and that grid is three dimensional. Oops, sorry. And it shows me the difference between those two point clouds and where that difference is highest. So this is not elevation values now, but rather differences um, between those two points. You know, what we're probably seeing here is uh, vegetation and building structures in one, and they didn't exist in the other. So then this tool has always made, of course, an output TIFF image as well, where the, the colored area then shows us those offset values. So just a few different ways to kind of understand information about our point clouds before we even get into um, any of the more advanced processing. But with that, Mackenzie, I will kick it back over to you. That sounds good. Uh, let me grab the screen back here and I will go ahead and share my global mapper workspace that I have open where we have um, another point cloud and some imagery just for reference here. And I'll be using this workspace to go over our next uh, three tips and tricks here. Um, numbers four, five, and six. Um, we're going to start with some manual classification keyboard shortcuts. So Global Mapper has um, a way that you can set up custom keyboard shortcuts. There are many keyboard shortcuts built into Global Mapper um, as defaults for the program, um, you know, including more generic keyboard shortcuts like Control S for save and Control O for open. Um, but up in this favorites toolbar with this big drop down next to our star button here, we have an option to set up 
favorites shortcut keys. So this allows you to create those custom shortcuts for your installation of Global Mapper for some of those functionalities that you use quite a bit. I, for digitizing and working with vector data, almost always create a shortcut for moving selected vertices. This is a function that has a toolbar button, but I like to have a quick keyboard shortcut if I'm doing a lot of just manual adjusting of um, polygon or line vertices. I also have here three other keyboard shortcuts for LiDAR classifications, and that's what this tip and trick is, is these um, specific keyboard shortcuts. They are set up and managed in this dialog. Uh, if I select one and hit the delete key on my keyboard, it removes it. Uh, we can add that back, of course, by choosing to add a new shortcut. We have our very long list of functionality here, um, but in the middle we'll see all of these LiDAR dash classify options. So we can LiDAR classify selected points as ground, I can set that as a particular shortcut key, add a modifier if I would like, um, the add of those modifiers and the available keys means that you can have many many custom shortcuts in your installation of Global Mapper. I'll add that shortcut and it pops up on our list. I'm going to add one more for classifying water here. I will add that as F5. We'll be using our function keys for this today. So now I've got this list. Once they're added, they're saved in your instance of Global Mapper. So I can go ahead and close that setup dialog and we can get to using these shortcuts. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Global Mapper has automatic point cloud um, classification tools for um, types like ground, buildings, vegetation, power lines, and pole features. Um, but there are additional classes that you may want to classify, or after those automatic classification tools have run, you may need to do a little bit of manual cleanup, or just doing some manual cleanup on pre-classified data that you've loaded into Global Mapper. So if I change my LiDAR draw mode here to color LiDAR by classification, uh, I've zoomed in on this area where we have a pond feature. Um, this is some LiDAR data for a golf course, just for reference here, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in an upcoming tip and trick. Um, but right now we have a pond right here. We can see that with our imagery. If I quickly toggle off that point cloud, the center of this pond, these returns have been classified as ground. I want to change these to water. So I will grab my digitizer polygon select tool. It allows me to freeform select an area of features, whether these are LIDAR returns, this selection mode also works on lines, points, and areas. Select these points, and then I believe F5 was my classify as water shortcut. Now I get this notification by default in Global Mapper just to make sure that you know you're making these manual edits to your uh, point cloud. But if I click don't ask again, Global Mapper is not going to ask me that every single time I go to use this shortcut. Um, so maybe, you know, I've forgotten just one return over there, classify that as water and we can see that change. So this is a really useful way to quickly reclassify some of these points. Um, you know, I've got a small bridge feature here over just a little creek that you know, is also not classified as water. We could correct that through some manual classification as well. Um, but that selection and manual classification process can be done in this top-down view or in a path profile or even a 3D view here. So I've drawn a path profile just over this bridge feature and we can pretty clearly see the bottom of where we have you know, the, the bed or the water, the banks of this little creek water feature running through this uh, golf course area and then our bridge above it. Um, I can use one of the selection modes in the path profile tool. We have a click and drag rectangular selection, um, hitting escape to deselect any points, a polygon select or a select LIDAR above or below line. So let's say above a line, 
I would just draw a line and it would select all of the returns above that. I will use my click and drag selection here so that I select all of those bridge points, what looks like some sort of railing and the surface, and clean that up so I'm not selecting too many low returns there. And then I have my shortcut set up for F4, classify as bridge, and we can see those points have been reassigned. I've already clicked that don't ask again uh, checkbox, so Global Mapper didn't have me do that extra click this time. Um, again, this is expanding the, the ways that you can do some of this manual classification. Um, there are these quick manual classification buttons um, up in the Path Profile toolbar and an overall Global Mapper toolbar for any selected uh, features, but you know, bridge isn't represented here, but I was able to I was able to add that custom shortcut um, for a bridge feature. Similarly, unclassified isn't available up in this um, toolbar here. We have a change lidar class button, but that's you know opening another dialog and doing a little more work. I've created a custom keyboard shortcut to change points from whatever class they are to unclassified. And I can do that here with my F3 key. And we've just unclassified those points that are underneath our bridge feature. So a lot of different ways you can go about selecting those points um, and those keyboard shortcuts for you know, that manual classification of LIDAR or many, many other functions in Global Mapper um, can help you be a little bit more efficient when you're doing some of those manual tasks and working with your data. Hey, Mac, we had a question come in, somebody asking about seeing the colors associated with a given classification. Do you want to pop that open and show that list? Absolutely. So, um, I actually changed the color of the bridge classification here from a, I think the default is a dark gray, and that can all be done in our LiDAR filter tool, our filter LiDAR data tool up from our first LiDAR toolbar. Um, we have our list of classes, and it's any of these named classes um, at the top of our list that can be made into keyboard shortcuts. Um, we'll work with our bridge class here just so we can see the effect of that. I can right click on any selected class in this list, choose to set the class color, pick any color I would like, and apply that change. So this allows you, again, to customize how you're looking at your, your LiDAR data based on classification here. Um, it can be really useful if you want certain features, certain classes to really stand out, or um, you, know, you can change the, the ground classification color uh, if you're showing it against, you know, LiDAR over some imagery and the ground is sort of blending in um, a lot that can be can be done there. And all of these classes have this option to set the class color and also change the class name if you want to just edit the name of the class as well. Someone asked if we can show this classification in the 3D window, um, and I can show the selection there in the 3D window. Um, any method for selecting you know, point cloud data is going to work for um, this method here. You just move my point cloud around a little bit, and I will try to select uh, some vegetation. Now the tricky thing with selection in the 3D view that we are going to see, I'll zoom out my 2D view so we can see it clearly, is when I use my digitizer to select in, to do a click and drag select in the 3D view, it's going to select all of the data within that box that I've drawn all the way back to the back of the sky box. So often if you're looking at this data in an oblique view, you know, we can see that reflected in our um, 2D view here. We've got this sort of trapezoid of selected data. I can select a smaller area of data. I've probably got some ground in there, but mostly vegetation. I can use a keyboard shortcut if I have one created for vegetation or my key here, and we have reclassified that as well. Um, you can also select individual LIDAR returns in this view as well. Um, 
when I select something, we can see I've got one point that's highlighted. I selected a single return here um, and everything else is a muted color. And that is the selection visualization that we have in the 3D view. Although that selection is linked in the 2D view, we can see uh, exactly which return I have selected there. So a bunch of different ways to go about doing this. Um, another great thing to note uh, when you're doing any of this manual editing that if you happen to misclassify something, uh, you can use that control Z on your keyboard. And I've just undone that vegetation classification that I applied in the 3D view that's removed from the file. I've undone that action. Um, so an easy way to go back with another keyboard shortcut if you need to undo uh, some manual edit that you've just made. Our next tip and trick goes right along with some of this point cloud editing that I've done. I've changed just a few uh, little areas of this point cloud, our bridge and our, our pond returns. Um, and if I save my global mapper workspace now, these edits are only going to be in this global mapper workspace. They haven't been written out to our original source file. Now I can, of course, export this file um, and export this to any supported LIDAR format. It's an LAS format right now um, and create a new version of this file with these changes included. But oftentimes when you're working with point clouds, you've done your classification routine, you've you know cleaned up your point cloud, done whatever editing is necessary. Um, and then you just want to save those changes to your original file. So you're not creating you know different versions of your point cloud file if you want to minimize the number of data files that you have for a specific area. Um, I can right click on my point cloud layer in the control center here and overwrite my original file to save the changes that I've made in Global Mapper here. So this is under layer, save changes over original data file. And this is for point cloud files, LAS and LAZ that you have made some changes to. So I'll click save. Global Mapper lets me know that I am indeed overwriting a file. I do want to do that. We've got just a little option here for some sorting. I'll just click OK. Global Mapper is going to save our changes that we've made to the external file, uh, utmgolfcourse.las. And if I bring up a blank Global Mapper workspace here, I can load in that same file from my list of recent files. And we can see, you know, our changed returns here. Um, so those changes have indeed been saved. So just another quick way to maybe avoid doing export or creating additional files when you just need to overwrite some changes in your original file. So with that, I'll come back to my original workspace here. Um, and we'll move on to tip and trick uh, number six, I believe. And this is going to be doing some custom manual extraction of features uh, using the segmentation tool in Global Mapper. So if I change my point cloud to RGB elevation, we're going to take a look at the uh, imagery that I have loaded in behind here. I've sort of faded the color on this. Um, and we can see that this is a golf course. Now a golf course has some particularly unique terrain. We've got these, some strips of vegetation, long open areas, and then we've got uh, greens that are, are pretty distinct. Um, just sort of a, a round blob feature, generally not too varying in elevation, pretty consistent uh, in surface. Um, and a lot of times, you know, when you're working with GIS data for an area, you want to pull out features that are unique in some way like this. Now in our imagery, they all look green, um, just like the fairways and other pieces of this golf course. But if we take a look at our point cloud, you know, we can't really see them when we're looking at it by um, elevation here, but if I change my draw mode, as Jeff was showing us earlier, to intensity, I can see clearly the intensity is different for these golf course 
greens, and indeed some of the bunkers and, and sand traps, other features here as well. Um, because we have some characteristics, um, you know, sort of flatter, pretty unique, consistent areas um, of ground in this point cloud, we can pull out these features from the point cloud using segmentation. So I've done this already using our segmentation by spectral graph partitioning tool. Um, you know, set some, some options here. I was weighting intensity very heavily because that is really what I'm seeing visually as um, making these green features unique from the surrounding ground area. Um, when I processed this segmentation, I'll bring up the result here by changing our draw mode once again. I also um, filtered my points by intensity values. So I used some feature information to go in and see the intensity values approximately for these areas that I want to extract. Um, and I was able to filter by intensity there. So I'm not doing a segmentation on the entire point cloud. I don't need those extreme high intensity values uh, that we're seeing for you know, trees and other things. We're just looking for those mid range values where we have these greens. So looking at the segmentation view, all these different colors represent different segments. We can see pretty clearly we've got these round, blobby green features, uh, not the color green, but the, the golf course green. Um, and I want to select those and create vector features from them to do this you know, extraction and get some vector features from this uh, point cloud. So I am going to grab my digitizer tool and then from my LiDAR toolbar, my select LiDAR segments tool. I'll pull up the 3D viewer as we do this, just so we can get another perspective uh, of this data here. Dock that on the side. And I'm going to start clicking on some of these features of interest. I'm holding the control key so that I can select multiple segments here. And a single click on a segment that I've identified with that tool is going to select all points in that segment. So just going through, selecting all of these features that I see using the mouse wheel click to, to quickly pan, but stay in that selection mode. And I've got a bunch of these features now selected. The next step that I'm going to take, we can see those selected in 3D view as well, um, is to create some vector features from these. And I can do that with a digitizer option under advanced feature creation options to create a coverage area for my selected or loaded features. It's going to work with the selected features since I have some features selected here. And we have this slider uh, in this concave hull creation options dialog um, for how rough or smooth we want to make this hull. Now, smooth is going to create a more rounded feature that encompasses you know, a larger area. Rough is more closely going to stick to the very close boundaries of the features we have selected. I actually want to set the smoothing factor way below what the slider even goes to, because I don't want these individual pockets of selected points to be connected in any way in my resulting vector features. I'll click OK. Global Mapper is going to quickly generate some features. We've got 14 features, one for each of our selected little areas. I'll close the 3D view here, and we can see those vector features uh, in our Global Mapper main view. I can throw those over the imagery. We can see our golf course, and we've got those greens now identified. We can calculate LIDAR statistics within these polygons, as Jeff showed us. Um, we can do some custom classification by selecting these uh, LIDAR points again. There's many different options, but we've just created some vector features uh, from a point cloud using a method that doesn't require adding a specific class. Um, it's just a matter of being able to identify the features that you want to create um, some, some vector objects from. These are now vector features. Uh, they can be a little bit rough since they're tracing those point returns. If we want to do any smoothing on them, we can always, still in segment select mode, I need to go back to regular digitizer mode. Uh, we can always use the digitizer 
move reshape smooth feature to smooth out some of those polygon boundaries as well. So just another way to pull some vector features from your point cloud, uh, maybe getting you closer to whatever final product you're looking for uh, in your analysis. So, so Mac, well, I have to ask, and we had somebody else ask, can you show us how you um, customize that shader? Yes, absolutely. It's one thing that I've started doing with point clouds when I'm looking working with intensity, mm -hmm. and I am always going to do this with point clouds now. Um, so I've set my, my LiDAR draw mode um, globally here by intensity. I can then go into my layer options for my point cloud layer. And down at the bottom, we have some options for intensity. So I can use grayscale and just dim or brighten that, or I can use a selected terrain shader. So this brings us to like all of the terrain shaders we have in Global Mapper. Um, you know, I can use that Atlas shader, apply that. Um, the default is the gradient shader. I wouldn't need to select that one specifically, but that's where we get this black and white uh, default intensity view. And then we have a bunch of different options. Um, I believe what I'm doing now, these are geared more towards, uh, or were added to Global Mapper, the Inferno, Magma, and Plasma um, as part of visualizing uh, relative elevation models. We have a specific shader for that, not doing much with the values that we have applied, um, but we have all of these options to pull out some of those intensity values a little more clearly. Um, I love this visualization because it shows our you know, paved surfaces, buildings, and vegetation really clearly from our ground, um, you know, that, that manicured landscape that we have going on in this scene. Uh, so again, another little tip and trick that we're throwing in there for you. <laughs> So with that, I think I'm going to pass the screen back to Jeff, and he is going to continue down our list of tips and tricks here. All righty. Thanks, Mac. That sounds good. Oh, God, what a great visual that is, especially on the golf course there. That looks really nice. Uh, okay, so we are um, back to our bridge here. Uh, we're going to talk about making 2D products um from a point cloud uh very often this is used very uh with intensity excuse me like mckenzie was just showing us uh with intensity values but also with rgb values if you have um rgb as part of your point cloud and what we're going to do is a twist on the traditional create elevation grid tool um, you know that allows us to make dsms dtms etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but we have this option here that we don't often talk about is the grid type. And in this case, I'm going to choose something other, other than elevation. Uh, specifically, I'm going to choose RGB. And what this allows me to do is output a um, RGB-based raster layer that's effectively going to look like an image. <clears throat> and I may have had my resolution up really high now that I think about that. So this might take uh, just a second, but what we'll see as our output here is a new raster image layer um, created from the RGB values associated with the point cloud. Um, <clears throat> this ends up taking a really long time, I will set my resolution a little lower I had it at one point spacing and as we saw earlier this was some incredibly high dense data but so now we have an image layer that is colored based on the values of the point cloud any sort of a analysis or editing you might do to your point cloud will come into play as well so maybe i'll go back in and i'm going to filter my point cloud a little um, so maybe i don't want any of those noise features right we talked about the roads earlier. Um, I'm also going to set an elevation value because I happen to know roughly where the bridge surface is from looking at it earlier. So I'm saying I don't want any points included below 22.6 meters and I don't want to include any noise points. 
and let's just bump this up a little so we're not sitting here forever. Um, and now we'll see, we toggle between those two layers, right? Now I've cleaned off all my, my low point noise, anything under the bridge, and I have a little bit clearer um, of a picture as to what my structure is underneath. Um, oftentimes this looks even better if we're talking about uh, aerial LIDAR, right? We won't see any little shadows from the scanners and things like that. But a great way now to just have some basic reference imagery of the area where you're working, um, if that's not something you have uh, otherwise with your flight data, it can be a handy little um, way to to, um, think, to learn some more about your point cloud there. Also worth noting, I won't go ahead and do this now, um, intensity is very common to do here. Um, if perhaps you want to perform some sort of subsequent image analysis. Um, Mackenzie just showed us how clear and how well those greens stood out. Um, that same idea could apply to something like water or the paved surfaces. Mackenzie mentioned the car pass and things like that. Or you could create a, a 2D raster of that and then perform um, some image analysis as well. So a whole bunch um, of different ways to kind of work with that data and, and perform, you know, subsequent analysis as well. Okay, let's change gears a little bit and we're not going to look at point cloud data anymore, but we'll go ahead um, and look at another pro tool. Let me open a new instance here. Um, we're going to look at a, no, a new pro tool tied to scripting, um, and Python and, and ways that we can automate our workflows. So right around when we release support for Python, we also released a new tool called the Script Builder. And what this tool does, I'm just gonna stick it over here on the side of my screen, um, is it records any scriptable command in Global Mapper. So you'll see it's running by default now. Um, and as I begin to do things in the application, it's going to record them um, as commands. So for instance, to start, I'm going to go ahead and let's load this file that I was working with earlier. Um, this is just the uh, point cloud here, Augusta main, but we'll see I have my import command and any parameters associated with it, in this case, file path and, and everything else. We'll look a little bit more at that in a second. From here, I'm gonna go ahead and create um, a terrain grid. And so I'm, I'm just working through some generic point cloud terrain related workflows for the sake of recording a, a complete workflow here. We're not, none of this functionality is, is anything new that we haven't discussed before. I'm gonna go ahead, let's turn that back to elevation, that one point spacing, and oh, maybe we'll make a DTM. Okay. So now I have a DTM from that point cloud. Perhaps, you know, maybe I want to make some contours as well. Uh, this is a pretty flat area. 10 meter contours is probably fine. Um, see, I have some contours now on my map. Um, specifically, I'm thinking maybe, you know, around the buildings here, some trees and some other stuff, but that's okay for right now. We're just doing it for, for demonstration purposes. And let's say to complete a workflow, what I'm going to do is export everything to a global mapper package file and on my desktop I'll just call that test so as as we've been working let me bring this up a little bit as we've been working each of these commands has been recorded um, if i expand this a little we can see all the parameters associated with those commands and any alerts or warnings, right? So the package file export, I have some things clicked that aren't scriptable because they're a visual related thing, um, but any other information that might come up as well. Now, I think one of the coolest features of this tool is I can live toggle between Python and native global mapper script. So I can just quickly change between languages and see how those, um, commands might differ between language. 
I can also directly open this in the built-in script editor. <clears throat> and it'll open in whatever language I had last had it on. So this is global mapper script. I can see each command that I executed and all of my parameters. This is a really great way to, um, you know, not only learn global mapper scripting, um, but also to, uh, you know, get a baseline for the structure of a script, right? If you're doing things over and over, you grab this and you adjust any parameters you need. Maybe you stick in a file loop around um, the data you're loading and things like that. I can open multiple scripts in the script editor. So I just changed my language over to Python. And now we have the full Python script here as well. Um, so if you are someone who does a lot of um, automation or repetitive processing, um, maybe you're just simply new to Python and Global Mapper, um, here's a great way to, to learn you know, how to write that and how to get scripts running quickly. Um, everything can be saved from here. You can open external scripts. This is a full, um, you know, script editor here that, that you can go ahead and work with um, your, your Python and your global mapper related scripts. So Jeff, if you could just again show where that script builder was open from, a couple people had missed that, um, and it's, it's oh, good yeah, to know yeah. how to open the tool. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, file menu, both the script builder and the script editor are listed here, right? So you could in fact go into the script editor and if you were feeling adventurous, begin typing, um, you know, out your script manually as well. Or if you had a script file, I don't know if I have any on my machine. Sometimes I keep a few around. I don't have any right now, handy. But um, you could open in a script file as well too. So a whole bunch of different ways to kind of to work with that data. Always fun to run your script in the main view if maybe you're importing some data and you want to see your inputs. Enabling this checkbox right here will have that happen right in the viewer. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's go ahead and I guess we're coming towards the end here. Um, don't need to save that. Uh, let's take a look at a little pixels to point feature that I really like. Um, <clears throat> so we happen to be back at a golf course. Um, this is actually a course near our office um, that some of our team members flew with our drone Mac. Was this one that you were a, a flight that you were a part of? I know you were at some of them. Yes, I was at that flight. Uh, it was great to see the, the drone flying around and get experience with that data collection side, which uh, we don't often get. We're usually at our computers working with the data. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's, there's a couple actually where we can like, I think the ones down by the waterfront, we have some other data where we can actually see our employees in the imagery. But anyway, tangent. Um, so uh, for those of you who are familiar with photogrammetric workflows, um, that process generally follows the idea of acquire imagery on a drone flight, analyze that imagery to create a point cloud, a 3D mesh, and an ortho image. But you may have scenarios where you just quickly want to view um, what we call a quick ortho of the data set. So rather than running a full analysis, you just want to take a look at what your images look like on the landscape. So I have some base map imagery loaded here and also a, a terrain layer um, from one of our, our data partners, Intermap, um, loaded as well that I use as a reference for the ortho rectification. Um, and then, so there's one image from the drone flight and here's another, obviously the whole flight has, you know, hundreds of photos, but for the sake of time today, I'm just gonna go ahead and look at two. Within the pixels to points tool, I will add my loaded picture points. So my two images, here's what they look like for reference. And from the map menu, I have the option to load my selected images as an ortho image. And process can take a minute or two, so we won't walk through it. I, I saved two outputs here. Um, it asks you if you want to do all your images or whatever the case may be, and it tells you that 
obviously running a full pixels to points analysis, you'll get better results. Would you like to continue without that? In this case, we do, we're just going quick and I can choose my reference data layer. So in this case, I'm using that intermap source that's loaded, um, but you can use any terrain source that um, you, you choose to. And then when I hit okay here, this would go ahead and run in process. Uh, it takes a minute or two, so I didn't want to make us sit live. Um, but then the result of that is those two images getting ortho rectified onto our map. And I had the base imagery here just to take a look at, you know, and see how well things lined up. Um, overall, you know, let's take a look at our northernmost point cloud. I was using the sand trap as a reference, right? The data lines up really well. So does the edge of the green. Obviously, we've got some <laughs> image quality differences. This is a very old satellite base map, but um, even down here, you know, if we take a look near the, the southernmost image, um, how well that lined up with those greens. Um, you know, we can't see the cart path actually in the, in the lower res imagery, um, but we can see the cart path there, how well the green lines up and things of that nature. So uh, a really handy way to get a quick reference of, of where your data um, may land on your map after a full rectification process. Also worth noting, uh, the feature info tool here, a quick click on that not only shows me just a basic image preview of my data, but it also calculates an estimate of the ground coverage polygon. So this is even you know, more rudimentary, but it gives you an idea of what part of your um, area of interest a given picture might cover. So a whole bunch of different ways to get a variety um, of quick little information about your images from your flights. So I just wanted to chime in with something that uh, I just thought of a, a, a use for, for some of those quick ortho images um, that folks might not think of. Um, you know, often when you're creating a full pixels to points output, there are areas of a scene that might not reconstruct well just due to the nature of that structure for motion process. Um, anywhere where there's movement, uh, you know, trees in the wind um, often don't reconstruct well in, you know, your point cloud output or what we're talking about here, uh, your overall full resolution ortho image. Um, being able to create those quick ortho images for small portions where you might have gaps in your um, main output ortho image um, can be used to fill in those gaps um, so that you don't have holes in your, your resulting image and you've got that, that full scene depicted. Um, since the quick ortho image, that the, the quick images that Jeff just demonstrated um, aren't going through that structure for motion process and then you know doing all of that pixel matching. Um, it will just project that image and, and give you a little bit of data, give you that color uh, for your reference image uh, where you might be lacking it from the full pixels to points process in some you know maybe vegetation or uh, areas with not very much texture. Yeah, that's a that's a phenomenal idea, not one that I had considered today when putting this together. I could have shown some data with gaps, <laughs> but thanks, Mackenzie. Of course, I just know we've gotten that question from users before. <laughs> yeah. um, but all right, Mac, I think I can uh, kick it back to you here. That's all I was going to show in this uh, this workflow. All right, that sounds good. I will grab the screen back and um, we'll move on to our last tip and trick here uh, where we're talking about terrain and image painting. Um, I've lumped these tools together. They're both Global Mapper Pro tools um, and they are similar, although they work on different types of data. Um, terrain painting was introduced first and image painting is a more recent addition to Global Mapper Pro. Um, and they both use the cursor or a selected feature as a brush and alter the values in a terrain layer or an image. So for this workspace, I have terrain and a land cover image, so a palette based image, although image paint can be used on any raster image you have loaded into Global Mapper. Um, and what I have outlined with a polygon is, you know, maybe a proposed development area. Um, you know, someone's going to put up a, a shopping center, some condos, a, a building, some sort of development going on to this parcel of land. 
And I just have that outlined with a regular old polygon um, drawn onto this data. So I've selected this polygon feature with my digitizer and we'll start with the terrain painting. So I've got my terrain layer showing here. I'll come up to my analysis toolbar and grab or enable my terrain painting tool. Now this is a little dockable window, so I can actually dock this down below my control center so it's not blocking any of my data view um, in my, my main 2D view. And we have a variety of operations that we can do here. Now, along with these operations, we have a bunch of different brush types. We have you know, altering just a point with a click, um, you know, one or a few pixels based on the brush size, uh, editing the terrain along a line or within an area that you draw. This last option here is to paint selected features. And since I have a vector feature, a polygon defining the area that I want to edit, I've got my selected feature. Next, I'm going to choose my operation. Now we have a lot of options here, but I'm going to select set my terrain height. And I know approximately the heights within this polygon. I will set this to 28.5 meters. So I'm just flattening this to a specific height with a feathering distance of 50. If I grab my point brush type really quickly, just to show, uh, we can see that feathering distance is that blue circle. So from the edge of my polygon, we'll be able to see sort of all of the terrain that will be edited is what falls within that blue circle and of course within the polygon. I'll go back to my paint selected features, leave the other options the same, and choose to paint that selected feature. I can see that the terrain has been edited here. We've got some nice slope coming off the outside of this polygon, that feathering distance that we used. Um, I can always undo that operation in terrain painting uh, if I want to redo it to, to bring that back. And that's all the editing that I'm going to do here for this one. We're just doing that paint by selected feature uh, brush type. Now the image paint tool works very similarly. I've just turned off that terrain layer where we've made an edit and uh, we have this land cover data. Um, so this you know, we can see has pretty large pixels here. Um, our selected development area doesn't cover that many pixels in the you know, size of this data. Um, but right now it's not classified correctly for our new development. We need to make this some sort of developed area. For this, I'm going to enable image painting because I want to change these uh, pixel values. Now, we have a lot of different operations that we can do here. Um, you know, filling a color, we're going to apply a color to some pixels here, um, marking things transparent, uh, replacing a color, and we'll show a couple of these. Again, we have the same brush types available for a lot of these operations but I'm again going to choose to paint the selected features. I am going to, let's say, first change my color, my um, pixel values for our palette image here to something from our palette. These are going to be automatically populated with the values in your palette if you're working on a palette image. So we're going to go developed open space and paint selected features. Now this is only painting those pixels that are mostly covered by the polygon. So I can come in and get my point type. And as I click, we can see that my cursor is highlighting individual pixels at a time. And I'm just filling in all of these pixels that I want to change to a developed open space. Now another option that I have is to replace color. So if I you know, made the wrong selection first here, maybe I don't want this to be developed open space. I want to change to uh, developed medium intensity or bright red uh, color is what this is going to look like. I'll choose my operation as replace color. My first option here is going to be the color that I want to uh, change pixels to. 
and the color to replace is going to be my developed open space. Now I can use any of our brush types here, but since I have a bunch of pixels selected or a bunch of pixels uh, that I edited, I will choose to use an area trace mode and just scribble a circle around the pixels I would like to edit. I've included some that are not in that developed open space um, in, uh, palette index, that developed open space color, but releasing that uh, trace mode lasso draw, I've just changed from one selected color to replace to my original color here. And again, just like terrain painting, we've got undo and redo buttons at the bottom of this image paint dialog. Um, and this provides you a lot of flexibility to you know, edit image data as you would like. Um, again, I'm working with a palette image here, so we've sort of got our defined set of colors, but you can use this on you know, aerial imagery, any type of raster image layer that you've got in Global Mapper. Um, some other operations here, like darkening and lightening colors, um, healing colors, so blending stuff in, uh, those may be more applicable to other image types. Um, but two very powerful tools in Global Mapper Pro that do similar functions on different types of data. So another, another way to edit and uh, change your data to be just what you need it to be. And I believe that wraps up all of our tips and tricks for this webinar. Um, that was all 10 of our tips and tricks that we had on our agenda here. Um, bunch working with LIDAR, and then we moved into some workflow optimization tools, um, you know, some pixels to points, and finishing with more terrain work. We've had a lot of great questions today, so we thank everyone for those questions and that interaction. Interaction. It's uh, always more fun to do a webinar when we're getting good questions and then we can tell that you guys are interested in the content that we're presenting. Um, if you don't have anything else to add, Jeff, um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. And if you have any questions, visit our website or you can reach out to our technical support team at geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day.